you to be the focal and the center point this morning. And we pray that as we open your word, that you would just sweep away all the things that would distract us from that and help us to see you with clarity. Teach us something about yourself, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a seat. You can grab your Bibles and you can go to the second book in the Bible, Exodus, in Exodus chapter 3. We're going to be talking about my favorite character in the Bible today, one that I can identify with the most, Moses. We'll be getting there in a moment. Exodus chapter Exodus chapter 3. Before we open the word, though, I just want to say uh, next week, we're going to have a special guest with us. I won't be here, but uh, for Thanksgiving Sunday, I've asked... A familiar face to Sturgeon Alliance, uh, if you've been here for any length of time. His name is Dan Harstead. He has an intern pastor here for a year, many years ago, and he'll be opening the word, and he's excited to come and share. He's on staff at uh, First Alliance in, uh, in Fort Saskatchewan. Anyway, and he's excited to come and share with us next week. So look forward to that. Exodus chapter 3. So in this series called Banners. We are learning, and more importantly, we are feeling. I'm going to move this before I get stabbed in the back. We are learning and we are feeling what it means to sit under the banner of God's love. We know what banners are like here, here. They announce something, proclaim something. Through an election, we've seen banners. They're proclaiming something. And it's based on this verse from Song Songs, Song of Songs 2-4, where it says, he leads me to his banquet table, and his banner over me is love. And this book, Song of Songs, we've said, we can read it literally, or crystal and Christologically. We can read it literally as it helps us in our relationships as husband and wife. It's a love, it's a love song, but it also helps us in our relationships with God, because Jesus is our bridegroom, and we, the church, are his bride. And so we can feel the affection of this verse for us, where it is the bridegroom, Christ, speaking to us, and he, or, or he, and we're well, speaking, but we're saying that he leads us to that banquet table and the banner that he places over us is love. But we've said that often we can put false banners over top of that love banner and we start living out that false identity. And, and it starts, even though we are securely attached to his love, we feel like we're insecurely attached because we put these false banners over top of that, or we let others put a false banner over top of us. And it leads to these unconscious coping mechanisms, these unhealthy patterns of behavior, we become anxious and avoidant, and it causes a lot of problems in our life. So this, this, this fall, we are exploring some of those false banners that we can put over our own heads, or we let other people put over our heads. And so last two weeks, we've been exploring the uh, chapter in Isaiah, Isaiah 40, and we looked at the false banners of ignored and hopeless. And this week, we are looking at the false banner of inadequate, kind of like wide-eyed, like, you, you, you want me to do that? Like the call of God, you want me to do that? Are you kidding me? Have any of you ever felt totally inadequate for the call that God has placed upon your life? Like, I don't have what it takes. I think we all have this secret fear that when it comes to the call of God and what he's calling us to do in any area of our life, we have this secret fear that we're going to be left high and dry. There's maybe a little bait and switch to this call. And we're going to be left in a place where, where we don't have the resources to do what God has called us to do. I think we all have that secret fear. Uh, many years ago, before we had kids, Eric and I, uh, my wife was, uh, uh, enjoys to run today, but she enjoyed to run back then. And so she would join these races. And we were living in Moncton, New Brunswick at the time. And, and, New, and, and, and New Brunswick had kind of an amateur race circuit. So every other weekend in the summer, they'd have a race in a certain city, in a certain town. And, and uh, there'd be like a 5K, a 10K, and a, and a 20K race. And there'd be men and women. And, you know, they have them everywhere, like races. And so she wanted to kind of enter in some of these races just to test herself. And, and so this is where, you know, we, Caleb was, what, 16? So this is like 17, 18 years ago before we had kids. And she wanted to enter this race, and we were in Moncton. So we showed up at this, 
this Christian university, which was kind of the host for the race, the start and the finish for this race, and it was going to go down the road and in the, in the subdivisions and then back and finish there. And we show up about maybe 45 minutes, an hour or early to this race and to register and pay your $10 and get your number and stretch and warm up and, you know, what they would do at a race like that. And so we're standing in line about 20 people deep at the registration desk and a guy comes by that I know, not a good friend, but I know him because he works at the Christian University, and I met him before, and, and uh, I was a youth pastor in town, and so we kind of connected to some other things, and he, I could tell he's kind of behind the scenes setting up for this race, and he has a truck, and he looks at me, and he, he kind of looks like he's real busy and kind of behind, you know, behind schedule, you know, when somebody looks like that, and, and, and he looks at me, and he says, are you doing anything right now? Can you help me? move a table. And I look at Erica and it's like an, you know, 45 minutes, an hour before the race. And she's just going to be, you know, waiting in line and then stretching and warming up. And I was like, sure. She says, sure, go ahead. So I jump in the truck and we go down to another building, fire some tables on this truck. And then we head down the road, a couple kilometers, turn into this subdivision, go another couple kilometers. And then we stop at this four way stop sign. And so he says, get off here and put those tables, set them up right over there. So I fire the tables off, and he takes off with the truck, more tables on this truck, and he's probably dropping them off at different places. And so I'm putting two and two together here that this is probably some sort of station along the race. And so I set these big, long tables up. It takes me a minute, <laughs> and I'm sitting on the table waiting for him to come back. And then another truck comes by, and they put this huge Gatorade thing of water there. You, you've seen them. They're huge tanks. And, and then another guy truck, truck comes by, and it puts this, this big white cups so I put two and two together, and I'm bored. And I think, well, this must be a water station, and then there's cups and there's water. Hmm. Um, water. Start filling cups. Why not? I'm not doing anything. I start filling cups with water, put it on. This is, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I've never done this before. Uh, it must be a water station, so I'm putting these cups on this table. And then another truck comes by and puts this big container there, and this is actual Gatorade. And then puts the green cups, the Gatorade green cups there. So I, well, Two and two together. Water Gatorade. So I start filling the Gatorade and putting them on the table. I'm the only one here at this, this station. And I'm looking at my watch and I'm waiting and I have the cup, the table full of, full of water and Gatorade. And then another truck comes by and he just slows down, rolls down the window and said, so-and-so, my friend who dropped me off there, said, you're supposed to stay here. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> All right, here I am to serve. I guess I'm a water station. Never done this before. Seen it in the Olympics where, you know, like they're holding water and as the guys run by and they grab it and throw it in their face. And so this is what I'm doing. I'm holding and, and I'm at a four-way stop. So I have no clue which direction they're coming from. Like I'm, I'm looking down this road, looking down this road, looking down. I'm the only one here. Looking down this way, looking down this way, looking down this way. And then all of a sudden I see this pack of runners coming and there's this one runner probably 200 yards in front of the pack. And he looks like he's like a hardcore runner. Um, and he comes by, and I'm holding out this water, and he doesn't take any. He just, he just runs right by me, just like driven. I'm like, man, this guy's going to win. And then the whole pack runs by, and some of them take water. And that was over in about 30 seconds. And I go, well, what do I do now? I look around. I'm looking down the roads this way, that way, this way, that way. And then I look back where they, they had come from, and here they, they had obviously made a loop, and they're coming back again. So I go, all right. So, I, so I, I get the water ready and the Gatorade, Gatorade in this hand, water in this hand, and I'm ready. And they're, they're walking, running by. And this time, this, this leader that was like a couple hundred yards is now like 400 yards in front of the pack. And I'm like, he's going to win this race. I don't even know what race this is, but he's probably going to win. And he comes right by me, doesn't even look at me, doesn't even acknowledge my existence, runs right by, whoo, just brushes my sleeve. I'm like, man, this guy's going to win. He runs right through the four-way intersection. He's about 400 yards ahead of the pack. He runs right through the intersection, and then all of a sudden he makes his like abrupt stop. And he turns to look at me, and he goes, which way do I go? <laughs> Apparently, I paused too long. I made the best educated guess that I could. And I said, that way. <laughs> Apparently, that didn't instill confidence in him, because he looked at me like, ah, like, you're running the race, man. How come you don't know? And he just runs off just shaking his head. And I wanted to scream out, dude, I just agreed to set up a table. I just agreed to set up a table. And here I am. I don't know what I'm doing here. Never done it before. 
I think when it comes to the call of God, we might feel the same way. There might be a little bit of a bait and switch to when he says, hey, come and do this. And you think, ah, am I going to get myself into a situation where I am not, don't have the resources physically, mentally, emotionally, or spiritually to actually deal with that? And you're going to be left in this situation where you literally don't know which way to go. You're at this four-way stop. And people are going to look at you and go like, yeah, well, how come? And you're like, I, I, I just agreed to set up a table, right? You'll be left high and dry. You'll be feeling inadequate. This feeling of inadequacy to the call of God, we've all sensed it at times in our life. Maybe for you, it was when you held your firstborn child. And you were like, where's the owner's manual to this thing? And you're like looking, like, where's the adult that's going to come? Like, am I, I'm in charge of this? This is me? I, I, how many remember that feeling of this total sense of inadequacy when you're like, I'm, I'm, just, I, I'm in charge? Me? Like, where's the adult? And then, like, it doesn't stop there. Like, you get to different stages of parenting, and you feel, still feel this sense of inadequacy right up until they leave home. Yeah, many of us are there. And maybe for you, this sense of inadequacy was when you went through this difficult season in your marriage, or, or you were asked to mentor someone, or you were, you were going to go on this mission trip to this foreign culture, or you were, you were asked to lead a Bible study, or to help out with the youth group, the hooligans, as, as John says, or, or, or even just to witness to your coworkers. You're like, I don't, I don't, I, I, what, if I, what if they ask me a question and I don't know the answer? I'm going to make God look bad. Or maybe you're going to hit the fifth or the fourth or the sixth or the seventh wave of COVID and, 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 and you're like, I don't have what it takes to enter that vortex again. I just, I just wave the white flag. I just, I don't have what it, I just feel totally inadequate. Well, if that's you here this morning, you're not alone. And what if I said that one of the quote unquote super heavyweight Old Testament heroes, perhaps the most famous guy in the Old Testament that God used in most amazing ways felt that exact same thing to the call of God. He felt inadequate. His name was Moses. Moses. Let's just set the stage for where we're going to go to in Exodus chapter 3 here. Moses, he had a bit of a convoluted childhood. He grew up in a rather hostile environment. He's an Israelite. He's, he's part of the people of God. And at the time when Moses is born, the Israelites are slaves in Egypt. If you know from the end of the book of Genesis, they are there because they came there. Joseph's brothers came there because of a famine. And then they settled in Goshen, and then they multiplied like rabbits. And there's like a million of them at the time Moses is born. And Pharaoh, Pharaoh gets really nervous because this people of Israel is, is growing under his kind of watch. And so he enslaves them to kind of control their numbers. That doesn't control their numbers. And so what he does is he does forced abortions. <laughs> He basically says every single male-born baby to the Israelites is to be thrown into the Nile River. Okay? And so this is the environment to which Moses is born. He's supposed to be killed. So he's born. His Israelite parents hide him. But you can only hide a crying baby for so long before the Egyptians go, what's that noise? And then finally, in an act of faith, the, his parents, can you imagine this gut-wrenching decision... They place him in a basket and float him on the Nile River because they would rather see him just float on the river than see the Egyptians chuck him in the river. Can you imagine that gut-wrenching decision? And in an act of the sovereignty of God, the strong arm of the Lord guided that little basket with that tiny little baby into the palace where the Pharaoh lives and the princess, the Pharaoh's daughter, grabs this basket pulls this baby out, calls it Moses. Moses means up out of water. And she raises this child, who is supposed to be a Hebrew slave, as her own son, as a prince of Egypt. Wow. So Moses grows up with this massive identity crisis, because later in life he realizes that his nation was Israel, and he was supposed to die, but now he's living in luxury as like a king in Egypt, while his fellow Israelites are being whipped and slaved and building cities, and, and he's in this massive identity crisis. And so one day, he sees an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Israelites, and he reacts probably out of the sense that he's the only one that can do something, and he ends up killing the Egyptian. 
and burying the body. A few days later, he sees his fellow Israelites, two of them were arguing, and he approaches them to say, hey, whoa, 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 stop arguing. They're, you're, they're fighting the wrong enemy here. And then comes this stinging phrase that played itself out over Moses' leadership career over and over again from the Hebrews. Who made you ruler over me? Track that phrase through Moses' leadership career. Who made you ruler over me? Are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? So Moses fears. It's found out. And so the Egyptians find out, and they want to kill Moses, and then the Israelites don't want Moses. So Moses runs. He flees. He runs to the wilderness, gets a new job as a shepherd, gets a wife, builds a family. For 40 years, 40 years, he thinks that's in the long-distant past. And then God shows up to him in a theophany, a burning bush, and says to him, I want you to go back where you came from, to Egypt, this whole vortex mess that you left, and I want you to take the people out of Egypt and then bring them out here and worship on this mountain, and I'm going to take you into the promised land. And Moses, in that moment, feels totally inadequate. Let's read the story. Exodus 3. Stand and read, and at the end of this, I'm going to say, this is the word of the Lord, and you are going to respond by saying, thanks be to God. Let's read this. Exodus 3.1. So now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Herob, the mountain of God. When the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flames of fire from within a bush. And Moses saw that through the bush, though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over and looked, he, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said, take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And they said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt and I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and bring them up to the land into a good spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way of the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt." Listen to Moses' four hesitations. Here's his first one. But Moses says to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people up out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask, What is his name? And then he said to that, and that, then what shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And God said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. Go assemble the elders in Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt, and I have promised to bring you up in your misery, up out, out of your misery in Egypt and into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land formed with milk and honey. The elders of Israel will listen to you. And then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels them. Look at the mighty hand and the outstretched arm. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed towards this people, so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters, and so I will plunder the Egyptians. 
And so Moses answered, but what if they do not believe me or listen to me? And they say, the Lord did not appear to you. Then the Lord said to him, what is in your hand? A staff replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. So Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. And the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And that's important. We'll come back to that. And so Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and turned back and turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that many believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. And then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand in his cloak, and when he took it out, his skin was leprous, and it became as white as snow. Now put it back into your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, he was restored. It was restored like the rest of his flesh. And then the Lord said, if they do not believe or pay attention to the first sign, they may believe the second. But if they do not believe these two signs or listen to them, then take some water from the Nile and pour it on dry ground. And the water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. And so Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. And the Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouth? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? It is not I, the Lord. Now go, I will help you and speak, help you speak and will teach you what to say. This is the word of the Lord. Have a seat. And so Moses, here at this burning bush, at this theophany, feels totally inadequate. And he has four objections that I'm sure every single one of us can identify with. Who am I? Who are you, God? What about them? What about the Israelites? And what about my issue? So let's just slowly unpack these. And I think we can identify this and listen to God's response to each one of these objections. In 1311, his first response is, who am I? Who am I? You might have noticed throughout this whole passage that he keeps saying, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And he must be thinking, man, you're putting me in the same sentence as those three super heavyweights in Israel's history? Who am I for them? Anyone remember this moment? You know who this is? He's actually a good Edmonton boy. John Scott, I heard it. John Scott. Back in 2016, uh, the NHL All-Star Game was dropped and plummeted in ratings. Nobody wanted to watch it. It was a bunch of millionaires just skating half-heartedly around the ice and, and goofing off. It, it was just nobody wanted to watch it. And so the NHL tried to spark interest in this NHL All-Star Game by allowing fans to vote on their favorite players, the, who, who they want to see in this All-Star Game. They thought that might spark it. Well, it backfired on them. Because some fans found a, a nobody below average player, this guy named John Scott, on social media. And they decided to build up support to get everyone to vote for this no-name player. This guy, John Scott, had, was up and down from the minors. Could barely make an NHL team. He scored maybe four goals in his whole NHL career. And he had a kind of a common name, John Scott. And so they, sure enough, time came for them to vote. And this guy got the most votes of all the players in the NHL. <laughs> much to the NHL's disdain, but they went with it anyway, and then they made rules so that that didn't happen another year. He became captain of the Pacific team. He got MVP of the game. The other players, as you can see, played it up too. They put him on their shoulders, and everybody was cheering for him. He, his helmet went into the NHL Hall of Fame, and I think they're even making a movie about this, and it may come out, out soon. But as they interviewed John Scott, he is just embracing the moment. He realized that the whole fans just kind of wanted to make a mockery of the whole thing, but he embraced the moment. In our story today, when God comes to him and says, hey, I want you to join the all-star team, Moses hesitates. John Scott embraces it. Moses does not. And the phrase that you see all throughout this passage, which we, you heard it, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the all-stars in Israel's history, Moses probably cringed when he heard that. You're putting me in the same sentence as those guys? You're putting me in the same sentence of, of Crosby and Ovechkin and McDavid? I'm going to be in the same locker room as them? I, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm the God of 
Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Plus, Moses is from Egypt, and Moses knows this one truth. You see this in the end of Genesis, where Joseph is talking to his brothers who have just come to Egypt because of the famine. And he says, don't tell them that you are shepherds, because Egyptians despise shepherds. They, didn't, they thought they were lowlifes, didn't like them. And so Moses, for 40 years, he's a shepherd. He's a wanted man because he's killed an Egyptian. The Israelites don't want him. Can you sense the hesitation? Somebody said once, this is, this is, this is like a, a mechanic going to go into Vladimir Putin's office and say, give up some of your power. That's the equivalent to it. Can you sense his hesitation? Who am I? And often we can have that same paralyzing fear when it that keeps us from embracing the call of God. But what I love about this whole God story called the Bible that appears over and over and over again like a broken record is that God always chooses the B team, the C team, and the D team to do amazing things for him. He doesn't choose the qualified. He doesn't choose the people that, that, that the world thinks is the most amazing to do great things for him. You remember in Revelation, there were seven churches that he spoke to. There's two that he hugged, five that he rebuked. Smyrna and Philadelphia, he hugged. Smyrna, he says, you're poor. Philadelphia, he says, you're of little strength. But yet they are the ones that have become victorious in the end over evil. David, King David, there's another example. He's off tending sheep when they come, Samuel comes to select a king. And they're like, is this all the brothers you have? And he, no, there's this other Rudy kid off tell you, do you really want him? Well, let's go fetch him. He's the B team. He's the C team. He's the D team. It reminds me of what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1. It says, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast in him. God loves to stack the odds against himself and come through and deliver because he gets all the glory. So, do you feel inadequate? Can you identify with, with Moses as who am I? When the call of God comes in your life to take on this difficult situation, well, you're in good company. Because all of the quote-unquote all super all-stars in the Bible felt the exact same well, exact same way. God chooses the B team, C team, and the D team. And yet all throughout this passage, 14 times, God says to Moses, I will be with you. I will be with you. Okay, so that's his first objection. Who am I? The second objection, objection is in, in verse number 13. Well, he says, well, who are you, God? I don't know enough about you, God. I don't even know what's your name. Now, the name of God was known to Moses and Israel. So he does know the name of God. The name Yah, Yahweh is known to the Israelites, and it was known to Moses. But names in the Bible carry different and, and perhaps more significant weight than they do in our culture today. Um, uh, God often would name someone something in conjunction with the work that he was doing. Or he would change the name of a person if he changed the direction of their life. Like Jacob, he changes to Israel, Abram, he changes to Abraham, Saul, he changes to Paul. Or he would name someone something in conjunction with the work that he's doing. Jesus, which means God is salvation. God is saved. This is going to be the person for which you receive salvation through. Okay, so Moses knows the name of God, but he's asking, what does your name mean in circumstances like this? When Israel has not heard from you for about 400 years in exile and they've, or, or, or in slavery, and they are in bondage, what does your name mean? What am I supposed to tell the people of God? And he says, this is the famous, I am. I am who I am. I don't know how else to put it other than God says, I am, which means... That he is the self-existing one, not dependent upon anyone else. Every single one of us in here depend upon others. When we're born, we need someone to, we need someone to feed us. And then we're going to be in a nursing home someday, and we need someone to look after us. God is eternal from past, present, and future. He is the self-existing one. He has all the resources within himself to sustain himself. He doesn't need anyone else. 
um, there's this phrase that uh, people who are not the people of God use in our culture today. And it's a phrase that is often used in vain because when they say it, they actually don't even recognize who they're talking to. They, I find it interesting if that, that uh, it, you know, people who are not the people of God, when they are overwhelmed, surprised, or scared, or even they see something beautiful or amazing, they will say, oh my God, right? And it's in vain because they aren't truly recognizing the creator of the earth. It just kind of flippantly comes off their tongue, oh my, oh my God, right? But it is also, ironically, a sentence that, or a phrase that you can use as a form of worship if you are the people of God. Oh my beloved God, if you are, you know, amazed of something or you're, there's something beautiful, it can be a form of worship where you can just say, oh my, you're just transcending your, this moment. But, but, it, but I find it interesting that the, the, the world, they, they don't go, oh my Confucius, oh my Buddha, oh my Allah, Oh my Yahweh. Interesting. But it's in vain because they don't recognize who they're talking to. But you can fully recognize who you're, and that can be a form of worship. Oh my beloved God. Often when people say it, I'll say, Oh, you believe in God too. <laughs> but here's the thing that is a phrase that God Himself would never say. Oh my self. Holy me. Like, what being is he calling on above himself? What, how, where is he transcending his worship in that moment? If, is he, when he's startled, he's never startled. He's never scared. He's, he never is amazed at something beautiful, and he doesn't have to transcend his worship to anyone. He is the, he's the self-existing one, not dependent upon every, anyone else. He never looks at the world and goes, oh, myself. Holy me. He just is. He's a self-existing one, not depending upon anyone else. And right in front of Moses is this illustration of this I am. This bush that burns but yet isn't consumed with fire. Fire, for the record, consumes things. <laughs> it burns things up and brings them to nothing. It needs a fuel source to sustain itself. And here we have this common thing, this, there's bushes everywhere that is, is burning, but yet isn't consumed. And this is going to be Moses to Pharaoh. Just think about this for a moment. This common, ordinary thing, Moses, is going to go, and he's going to have resources that are not of this world, is going to have a fuel source that's not of this world, and the fire of God is going to come upon him, but yet not consume him. Isn't that amazing? In the book of Acts, we know that, that, that the Holy Spirit comes upon us in fire. And so the New Testament times, even more so, the Holy Spirit can, can fill us. So that the great I am gives us the full adequacy in that moment to do what he's called us to do. We have a fuel source, a resource that's not of this world. Isn't that amazing? If you are... If you've been following God, if you're or the people of God, if you've been following God for a, a season of your life, I know if I were to sit down and have a conversation with you, there will be times in your life where you could look back and every single one of you have a, what I call, that wasn't me moment. I can look back to a season of my life and, and I came through that and I can say whatever it was that got me through there. I know Brent and Brent didn't have the resources to get through there in his humanness. Whatever happened and I got through that, that wasn't me. Maybe it was a, 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 some sickness that you were dealing with in your family or in your own life. And you, by all stretches, by, by, by all reason in this world, you should have been in the fetal position, overwhelmed and scared and terrified. But you look back at that and you came through that and you can look back and say that wasn't me. Maybe it was a financial difficulty. Maybe it'll be COVID someday. And you can look back and say, I don't know how I made it through, but that wasn't me. Do you know what it was? It was the great I am, this, this fire burning within with the resources that are not of this world that has given you strength for that moment. The Holy Spirit. And so Moses is going to Pharaoh. 
And someday he's going to sit at the campfire reminiscing about this exodus, about bringing people out of the, the, the promised land. And he's going to look back and go, that wasn't me. That plagues thing, that wasn't me. That, that going through the Red Sea, that wasn't me. That, that pillar of fire thing, that wasn't me. And now the people kind of wanted to mutiny and I just held strength. That, that, that wasn't me either. That wasn't me. That was the great I am in me. And there is this other image that goes in with this conjunction, or that goes in conjunction with this I am. Right after that, he talks about this mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Remember we talked about this the past two Sundays? This is the most common personification of God in the Bible. This, this mighty hand and an outstretched arm. You want to have an amazing Bible study, Google this, and see how many times in the prophets and in the Psalms, and especially in Deuteronomy, and in Exodus, this is used, this phrase is used in conjunction with the Exodus, of taking people out of Egypt and into the promised land, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Remember we said that the arm of the Lord in the Bible is never passive. It's always active working on behalf of his people. It's not Mr. Universe, it's the World Strongman competition. Remember this? It's not like these big muscular guys on stage like Arnold Schwarzenegger, the most famous Mr. Universe. He said, look at my useless muscles. They're completely useless. Admire my useless muscles. And God is not like this. I'm going to walk like this and admire my completely useless muscles. Versus the world's strongman competition of these guys with pragmatic, useful muscle that are lifting these massive boulders and carrying them half a football field, that are, that are flipping over tractor tires, that are pulling transport trucks. That is the strong arm of the Lord. It's a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. So it's not here, look at this. It's outstretched down in the earth, helping and supporting his people. Here, some plagues that'll make Pharaoh may you want to leave Egypt. We're going to go into the wilderness here. And then Pharaoh's going to chase you. We're going to put up the pillar of fire here. And then they're going to be trapped in the Red Sea. So let's move the water. You're going to walk through on dry ground. It's the mighty hand and an outstretched arm that's working on behalf of its people. There's this movie uh, called Exodus, King and Queens. <laughs> Gods and Kings, King and Queens. Made in 2014. Terrible, unbiblical movie. I like some Christian movies. I hate others. They are like nails on the chalkboard for me, theologically. Don't watch it, but watch it reading the Bible, or read the Bible first. It, it makes Moses into this militia leader that goes back to Egypt, and at night he raises this militia, and while they're slaves all day, and they're learning how to shoot their bows straight, and work their swords, and run on a chariot, because he's going to fight the Egyptians, as if they did it, and God just gave them with a mighty arm just a nudge to help them out with a few plagues. It just, it just mm, drives me nuts. Because if you read the story, God is everything, and the people did nothing. They just were along for the ride. That's the true biblical account. It's with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm that God does all these things. But look, here's what I noticed. Look at what this mighty hand and this outstretched arm is going to do. Look at verse number 19. This is interesting. I thought this was funny. But know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless my mighty hand compels him. So I'll stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians. And how's it gonna, what's going to happen? Verse 21. I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed towards the people. Okay, ladies, you're going to like this. this. This is a stereotype, but you'll hate me for it. But here we go. What are you going to do? Ladies, you're going to go on a free shopping spree. Go to the Egyptians, and they're going to give you jewelry and clothes. Hello. Free shopping spree. Free clothes. And, but just like all motherhood, motherhood just, just see what they need to do. Which you will give to your sons and daughters. That's how motherhood works, right, ladies? Thank God for mothers. But, but, but did you see how the mighty hand and the outstretched arm of God is going to abundantly provide for his people? I'm going to make them favorably disposed towards you so that when you leave Egypt, the Egyptians are going to be like, here, take our stuff, take our stuff, take our stuff. And you get to go on a free shopping spree, all the jewelry and the gold and the silver and the clothing, and then you're going to give it to your kids. I know that was funny. 
Do you feel inadequate? Where do you need to trust the great I am? Where do you need to trust the self-sufficient one with unlimited resources outside of this world? So he's asking, who am I? But then who are you, God? And then his answer is, is, I am, and I have unlimited resources. I'm the self-existing one, not dependent upon anyone else. And the third objection that Moses has is, what about them? In first, chapter 4, verse 1. What about those people? And I think this one hits the closest home for Moses. Because he remembers his failed attempts of leadership in the past. He left Egypt, and there was two groups of people that didn't like him. Israel and Egypt. And he has to deal with these stories that he's built up in his mind of these rumors that he thinks people have about him. And that can be very difficult. This is, and for me, uh, personally, one of the things that I have to deal with. One of the things I also notice that other people have to deal with. That's one of the major hang-ups to following the call of God in your life. Is dealing with, how are people going to see me? What are the rumors that they're saying about me? But, like God gives every prophet in the Bible, he gives them this ability to perform signs as proof that God is with them. In the first few verses of chapter 4 there, he gives them the ability to do three signs. Remember what they were? The snake, the staff turns to snake and then back to staff again. He puts his hand in his cloak and the leprosy and it comes back out and then take the Nile River and pour it on the ground and it becomes blood. Now each one of those would have been evidence, just like all the prophets in the Bible, that God was with that person. But they're also illustrations for the people to show them that what God is going to do. The snake, the staff. Now, what is that teaching the people? What is that teaching Moses? Well, if you know anything about e Egyptian religion... In those days, the snake was a prominent thing worshipped in the Egyptian religion. And even on the Pharaoh's headdress, there was a snake. So anyone would have seen that miracle if he throws his staff on the ground, it becomes a snake. And then Moses grabs the snake. It would show them that God had given Moses the ability to control Pharaoh. But not only that. Listen to this. Look in the story. He says, reach out your hand and take the snake by the tail. Now, I'm not a snake person. And I doubt it's too many people here that are snake people because we live in northern Alberta. But I'm told, and you can research this online, that is an absolute no-no if you want to grab a snake. You never grab a snake by a tail because it's still dangerous. It can then just come back and bite you. In fact, it probably will come back and bite you. You never grab a snake by a tail. You always grab a snake right behind the head. Because then you can lift it up if you have the guts. <laughs> and the dangerous part's right there. And you can control that. You never grab by the tail. It doesn't matter if it squirms. But you never grab by the tail because that dangerous part can nearly get you. And God tells Moses to do something very unorthodox. Not normal. Grab the snake by the tail. Because the way that Moses is going to control Pharaoh, the way that Moses is going to let the people, you know, God's going to use Moses to get the people out of Egypt and into the promised land is he's going to do something not normal. A normal way to free people who are in slavery is to storm the beaches of Normandy and fight the Nazis to get the rest of the people who are in the concentration camps eventually. To take all the military might that you have, the Rudy Tooty Shooties, and blow them up and push them back. And Moses has nothing. He's going to go in a rather unorthodox way. And God is going to come through in a big way. Isn't that amazing? Grab the tail, Moses. What? Are you willing to trust that God is going to come through for you in an unorthodox way? A not normal way. Hmm. And then the other two, the, the, the put the leprosy, or put your hand in your cloak, and then it comes out leprosy, and then goes back in. That, that simply that God has the ability to give and restore life and take it away. 
Then the Nile River, like you go and you dip some water in, then you pour it out and it becomes blood on the ground. That, that would have been actually an encouraging thing for the people of God because then that means that they would have seen that God had seen the blood spilled by Pharaoh by throwing all those male-born babies into the Nile River and he's coming back packing heat. Are you feeling inadequate? Are you willing to trust that there might be some unorthodox way that God might come through for you? And the last one is, what about my issue? What about my issue, God? I, 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 I don't speak well in public. We all have weaknesses. I know myself better than you, and you know you better than you, and you have issues, and you have weaknesses. And this, this weakness that, that Moses points out, or this insecurity, or this fear, is, is, is probably one of the biggest fears that, that most people have. They say the fear of death is, is number one, fear of public speaking is number two. I think Jerry Seinfeld said that people would rather be the subject of a funeral than, than speak at one. <laughs> it just shows that we all have this, this fear, and I did too, before I went into ministry. I mean, you want me to talk for 30 minutes, God, about you on a Sunday? I'm like, you kidding me? Now I can't keep it to 30 minutes. Like, but he literally says here, I am dull of mouth and tongue. <laughs> I'm dull of mouth and tongue. God, God, I spend my time yelling at sheep. I don't spend my time crafting speeches for, for diplomats. I have these issues, God. I, I have these weaknesses. And God's response to them is, is like, who made language? Who made mouths? I'm reminded of what Paul said when he asked God to take this thorn in the flesh away from you, God responded by saying, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In Nova Scotia, where I visited this summer, they have this tiny little zoo that would be nothing like the Calgary Zoo at all, but it's, it's, it's called Oakland Farm Zoo, not far from where I grew up. And just up until a few years ago, it had one of the largest, had the largest lions in captivity in the world. In this nowhere place in Nova Scotia, not San Diego Zoo, not a place in the States, no place in Africa, 807 pounds. That's Rutledge in the middle there on the left. 870 pounds of king of the jungle beast. And they say that lions are bigger in captivity than they are in the wild because they eat better. So this very well at the time could have been until he died just a few years ago, the largest lion in the world. And there's this huge pen, probably four or five times the size of this sanctuary where it's double fenced. And this, this lady who is kind of the trainer is standing between that double fence there. And I remember we used to go to this zoo almost every year, this little nothing zoo, and it had monkeys and it had camels and it had pigs and it had chickens and it had all like the other farm animals and things like that. And you could go to the zoo and you could watch all those things and they were fun. But I always loved to try and get as close as I could to these lions. There's a whole pride of lions, probably six or seven of them in this area with Rutledge being the, the, the largest lion. I don't know if you've ever heard a lion roar. I have friends who live about three kilometers away from that zoo that they say they can hear feeding time every single night. That'll shake every bone in your body. And I, that, those lines there will pace back and forth as you can see where the, it's, it's just worn out. So you're, you're double fenced. So there's like 15 feet between the fences. And so you can really only get so close. But I would like try to get as close as I could as this lion just purrs, shaking every bone in your body, just walking back and forth, looking at you, knowing full well that if that fence was not there, you would be its next lunch. It's called king of the jungle for a reason. And Moses stands in the presence of Almighty God. And he knows his name. And if his name is the great I am, 
Moses must feel in that moment that my name is the great I am not. <laughs> He's the all-sufficient one. He's the adequate one. I'm, I'm the one that doesn't have the adequacy. My adequacy comes from him. And that's an important thing because he's going to Pharaoh, Pharaoh who thinks he is God. Moses, are you going to let these people out of Egypt? No, I'm not. Are you going to really send these plagues? No, I'm not, but, but I am. There's a train coming for you. He's got something coming for you. There's no stopping it. I went to see Louis Giglio, one of my favorite speakers in the States. I went to go see him at a youth conference. Oh, it must have been 15 years ago in Pittsburgh. And he spoke about this. Moses, the great I am. And he kind of contrasts it to John the Baptist in the New Testament. About John said, I am not the Christ. And he came up with this, this phrase that just really sticks. Which is something that we can live. It's kind of a play on words. I am not, but I know I am. And let's not... The, the power of positive thinking, just kind of talk yourself into it. But, but it, it's saying that I, I, I don't have the adequacy in myself, but I am connected to, through Christ, the great I am, and he is the one that makes me adequate. I am not, but I know the great I am. You know, there, there, there's a tremendous peace, and there's a tremendous freedom, and there's a tremendous rest that comes when we embrace that simple sentence, I am not, but I know I am. How many have ever felt this before? Who could be smart enough to figure this out? I am. <laughs> if I don't do it, who will? I am. Nobody's listening to me. I am. Who can I trust? I am. Who's going to provide for me? I am. What will others think? I am. <laughs> Who's going to want me after this? I am. I've given it all, but it's never enough. I am. I can't hold it together anymore. I am. I'm done. I am. Somebody just hold me. I am. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the savior, I'm the redeemer, I'm the solution, I'm the restore, I'm the builder, I'm the healer, I'm the answer, I'm the provider, I'm the all-present one, I'm the all-powerful one, I'm the all-knowing one, I'm the bread of life, I'm the light of the world, I'm the good shepherd, I'm the living one, I'm the true vine, I'm the mighty one, I'm the wise one, I'm the eternal one, I am the alpha, I'm the omega, I'm the beginning and the end, I'm the coming one, I am the Lord. Are you feeling inadequate? Maybe it's time we embrace the sentence, I am not, but I know the great I am. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. Corey Ten Boone is the famous Christian Holocaust survivor who forgave her Nazi captors, died a few years ago. But she is quoted as saying this. I'll leave you with this. It's not my ability, but my response to God's ability that counts. It's not my ability, but my response to God's ability that counts. I've heard it also said, it's not your ability, but your availability is what God wants. It's not your ability, but your availability. I don't know where you are today and where you feel inadequate and what area the Lord has touched your heart with, with his Holy Spirit. 
But I want you to know that if you are in Christ, if you accepted him as your Lord and your Savior, that the banner that is over you is not inadequate. (laughs) That the banner over you is love. Let's pray. Father, in a room like this, I know there's so many issues and so many struggles where we feel like we are alone in our struggle. I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would just come upon 